Well, good morning, Venture. And say hello to those in the classic service who are watching, those who are watching online. I want to encourage you as we're continuing on in this series, uh, we're looking at these uh, key issues, key questions people have about Christianity and core reasons of why they can't believe it. And today, I think it's, it's one of the most fundamental topics we're going to talk about today because it's so important to our belief is can I even believe the Bible is true? Can I believe the Bible is true? I mean, you, you think about it with the Bible, everything that we talk about every week that we're here, I'm going through this text, we've built our life to it. And those on the outside, if you've not grown up in the church, and maybe you're here today with questions, and even those in the church have a lot of questions about it. And so we're gonna cover some ground today because I think it's so important and I really want, especially those of you, if you're high school, middle school, college students that may be hearing this, you're really having to wrestle with these issues. You're confronted with a lot of stuff. And, and frankly, if we're honest, there's a lot of people out there, they look at us and they go, I, I can't believe that people in the 21st century, especially here in Silicon Valley, smart people would align their lives to a book that was supposedly written a couple of thousand years ago. Uh, Sam Harris, the, the atheist, he, he said, tell a devout Christian that his wife is cheating on him or that frozen yogurt can make him invisible, and he is likely to require as much evidence as anyone else. But tell him the book that he keeps by his bed was written by an invisible deity who will punish him with fire for eternity if he fails to accept its every incredible claim about the universe. And he seems to require no evidence at all. Now, as Harris is prone to do, he loves to overstate his case. But there is a part where people look at it and they go, yeah, you guys just blindly accept this book. And, and you think about it. I mean, when you read through the Bible, all through it, it says, thus saith the Lord. We actually call it, we call it God's word. We're saying someone has spoken for God. And, and so we probably do need to make sure it's accurate. We do need to make sure it's trustworthy. That we would actually believe that it's actually inspired by God. In fact, that's how Paul describes the Bible. He says, all scripture is breathed out, that's that word inspiration, it's breathed out by God and it's profitable. All of it's profitable, whether it's teaching, reproof, correction, training and righteousness. And so, so this internal claim of scriptures, we actually believed it's been God breathed, it's been inspired, it's without error that he has given this to us. And so we probably should be accurate if we're saying we're speaking for God, man, it, it better be clear. I, I don't know. I, I've had people, uh, it happens at work sometimes. We'll have a meeting and then later I'll see a department or talk to a department head and I'll go, why are you guys doing that? And they'll say, well, we heard that you said, and sometimes it's accurate. And sometimes I'm like, I did not say that. Now that's just me in one church, one department. You imagine how much more important it is if we're saying God said this is God's word, if Paul makes a claim that it's breathed out by God, we better hope that it's pretty trustworthy. And let me say, as I've said on every week of this, what we're talking about here requires faith. So there's nothing I'm gonna to present today. And I'm gonna present a lot of evidence today. We're gonna to walk through a lot of stuff. But there's nothing that we're gonna to get to the end of it that you just go, oh, okay, I... I can rationally accept that at all costs. I don't require any faith at all. God designed it from the beginning that he wanted us to believe by faith, believe in him by faith. He gave us this communication. And, and I've got to believe if you just step back, if there is a God, if there is a God, wouldn't he want to communicate with us? But he didn't choose to just drop this down from heaven. Sometimes that's how it's presented in church. It's almost like this is God's word that, you know, there was this point in history that it was like, oh, and this came plopping down. And we go, okay, we have the word of God. Now, there's, there's a whole process of how this came together. And so you think about it, how was the Bible even written? 
Well, Peter describes it. He's somebody who wrote books in the Bible. And so he describes it. He said, knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture. There's, there's nobody who's speaking for God. A prophet was a truth teller who's speaking for God. Any of us that, that spoke scripture, that wrote scripture, it doesn't come from the person's own interpretation for no prophecy was produced by the will of man. But men, and look at how he describes the process. He says, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He says there's this superintending process where the Holy Spirit was, was guiding the process in this. That, that God was governing how they spoke and how they wrote and how they worked in that. And, and as you look at that, it, it doesn't mean that they sat down one day and they you know, kind of went into a trance and started writing things and they didn't know what they were writing. That's not what he's describing. Uh, with that. Nor does it mean that somebody got up one day and they go, you know, I'm going to write a book of the Bible. I'm going to speak for God today. I got to make it really good. He said, no, it, it wasn't their own doing, their own interpretation. But God used the context of what they were writing. They may have been writing a history because a history of the Israelite people was needed. They been, may have been writing out that we need to Moses took both the history of the world and the law and all that, and God moved through him in that. They may have been a prophet that was correcting something that was going on in the nation. They may have been a poet that said, man, this is a worship poem that I want to have for the people of God. And in that process, God moved through the human to create something that we would say is miraculous. And, and, I mean, our faith, we see this. God plus a human mother, Mary, we believe that God through a human produced Jesus, the living word. And in the same way, God plus these human authors produced the Bible, this, this written word that we have. And, and I'll say again, right, right out of the gate, we, we see the miraculous, the mysterious part of this. I, I can't sit here today and go, man, let me tell you exactly how that process went when the Holy Spirit carried him, other than God was in control. But the other part that we need to realize, in the same way when Jesus was born, he actually had genetic material for Mary. He reflected humanity. He's fully human in that way. And in the same way, the Bible, the Holy Spirit governs it and speaks through it and was in that process, but it reflects each of those humans. The writing's different in it. The personalities are different in it. I'll just give you one example. Two guys that were in the early church, so pretty close together, John and Paul. If you look at their writing, in English it doesn't always show up. Because in English it's been translated later and it's kind of phrased in a way that we would understand. Let me show you. This is John 1.1 in Greek. And if you've ever been a Greek student, I go back to my days of Greek in college and then several years in seminary. Uh, when you start Greek, you know who you love? You love John. In fact, they'll start you in John because John is so simple with it. He, he kind of, he uses simpler words and simpler phrasing. So John 1.1, 1, 1, in RK, in the beginning, we get archaeology, RK, was ain hologos, was the word. In the beginning was the word. And hologos was prone with Theon, with God. The word was with God, uh, and the word was God. I mean, you, you start reading through John and you go, I think I can be a Greek scholar. Now, there's a reason the teacher starts you there, because he did. He wrote in real simple ways, simple phrases, deep thoughts, simple phrasing. And, and then you kind of go through and you're taking your first year of Greek and you've been reading John and you're working through it. And then you take your next course and they drop you into some Paul. Remember, Paul's a legal scholar. And, and Paul, and let me give you, here's, here's Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. <laughs> now, again, you go, Tim, I, I can't read it. You couldn't read it anyway. So I did, if I blew it up, you wouldn't be like, oh, now I understand it. It's kind of all Greek to me with it. Uh, here's why I put this. This is one sentence. In English, you go through all those verses and it's like a bunch of sentences because Paul's a passionate writer and he's a deep thinker and he'd start adding and he'll add participle and he'll add this phrase and he'll move that and all these things. And so as he's writing, he gets going with it and it's so different than John. And what you see in it, and here's what you'll see as you read through the Bible is you go back through that. 
It's not like God controlled these people in a trance and they just started doing it. He worked miraculously through them individually. And through the superintending of the Holy Spirit, you get the strengths of a Paul and the strengths of a John and a perspective with that. All of these books that were written in all these different ways, I mean, you, you look at it, the Bible, 66 books or letters. And some of them are history, some of them are chronology, some of them are law, some of them are poetry, some of them are prophecy, some of them are letters that are addressing specific things. And so part of it, when people go, man, the, the Bible, they treat it like it's just one plop thing. No, you got to understand the context with it. It was written over 1,600 years, maybe up to 2,000 years, depending on how you date it. But conservatively, it took 1,600 years to produce. It has 40 different authors from all different walks of life. Everything from kings to poets, to, to lawgivers, to leaders, to farmers, to shepherds. I mean, you've got all these different people written on three different continents and three different languages. And, and there's no other book that's been produced like this. No other book that's come together in this way. And the interesting part is the continuity through all of that. As you look at it, if I, if I were to say, man, I'm going to now have a book that over the next 1,600 years, it's going to be written on three different continents and three different languages by 40 different authors, many of whom never knew each other. And it's going to have this level of continuity. In fact, I, I, I love the way uh, Chris Harrison, he, he wanted to chart because he started looking at all the cross references. You read through the Bible and you start realizing the Bible refers to itself and all the connection points with that and the verses and the strengths of that connection. And so they got together and he said, I want to visually show all the cross references. There's about 67, 68,000 cross references in the Bible where it's connecting together. And so he created this pictorial graphic. And what you see, each of these, I don't know if you can tell, each of these represent a different book of the Bible. So when the color changed, the books change. Uh, there's Psalm, uh, what is the longest chapter? 139 or 119 with it. Do you see how long that chapter is? Matthew shows up here in white. And all these colored lines you're seeing are a connection from this book or that one refers to it. Over a book and through a book, it was written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors. There, there's a part of that you, you do have to stand back. There, there's no other book that's been produced like this. There's no other holy book that's produced like this. There's no other book that has this continuity with it. And so as you look at it, I mean, at first we go, okay, there is something pretty amazing about that. But, but then the question comes up and people ask me, they go, okay, wait, I, but Tim, I read the Da Vinci Code. And I listened, you know, I listened to NPR and I saw that, you know, they talked about the gospel of Thomas and how the early church were against women. And so they threw these books out. So how did the books even get into it? How did they decide? And so there's a process, it's called canonization, canon. And here's what I mean with that. Canon, canon, anytime you see that, it's not talking about a gun that shoots a big cannonball. It's talking about the books that are recognized to be divinely inspired and included in the Bible the books that became recognized as scripture. Now again, because the Bible didn't plop down out of heaven. These books were written by real people as they were spread out. The early church recognized, wait a second, there's something different about this letter. There's something different about this book. That they did that, the people of Israel did the same in that process. And again, I would just go back to the miracle of Jesus. It's very similar to the miracle of Jesus. When Jesus was growing up as a little boy, Nobody walked up to him and go, oh, you're God. Even his disciples, as they saw him do the things of God, there came a point that through the miracles, through that, through his death and resurrection, they reached a point they recognized, wait a second, he's not just a human Messiah. He's actually, he was recognized as God. Same thing with the Bible. The Bible is expressed through humans, but as the church interacted, as they saw the power of it, as they looked at it, they said, hey, some of these letters, some of these books are different than the others. There's a divine imprint on that. That's why Peter was trying to describe it. It wasn't from human. It was God moving through that. And so the church had to have a, prop, a process. The Jewish people had a process that they recognized with what they called 24 books, uh, we have 39. It's the exact same books, they just number different. We go first and second Samuel, they'd call that's one book. They call the first five books one book, the Torah. 
And so we have the exact same books. And in 90 AD, there was this council in Jamnia where they, they, they again codified and they looked at it. And, and so we can know as a church from the Old Testament, the same scriptures Jesus was using, we're using. It goes all the way back. It was codified in that time frame. Now in the New Testament, these New Testament books started getting written. And you can even see in it that they recognize, the apostles started recognizing with each other. Peter starts talking about Paul's writings and he quotes Paul and he says, man, Paul is inspired. Uh, Paul talks about Luke's writings and he equates it to the same thing as the Old Testament. So they're seeing it happen, but there had to be a process in a time period when you didn't have any technology we have today. So you don't have like, you can send it, you can mail it. There's no book form. There's no printing press at this point. They're writing on scrolls. And over that time period, the church looked at it and they go, hey, we need to officially recognize which of these books really are scripture. And here's, here's the thing. And this is where Dan Brown and others, you know, they drive me crazy because they, oh, it's a conspiracy and all this. If you go back to it, you've got a church that from day one, they were looking at and going, we've got to gather this, but let's use a rational process for discovering this. Here's the criteria that they used. They said, when we look at a book, we want to go, did this book go back to one of the apostles or his authority over it? Was it somebody that was with Jesus that wrote this? Or he had authority over the person. So Mark wrote it under Peter. Peter described it with it. Luke with Paul in that. They Secondly, they said, has it been accepted by the church at large? Is the church using it? Do they recognize the spiritual power of this book? Does it have orthodox doctrine and teaching? Is it teaching crazy stuff? If it's got really weird stuff that hasn't matched anything, okay, we've got to look at it with suspect. And is there intrinsic authority reflecting the work of the Holy Spirit? Remember, Jesus promised us, he said to the church, he said, hey, I'm going to leave, but the Spirit's going to come and he'll guide you into truth. And so part of the belief of the church was, the, is the Holy Spirit guiding us as we look at it and determine these scriptures? And, and if you, you look at it, there was some debate, there was a debate over Hebrews because they didn't know who wrote it but it met all of these other criteria and some thought Paul had written it. Um, some of the books that are presented today, so you'll hear in, in, in popular culture today, uh, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas. You know, these are the ones that were thrown out with it. Guys, these books were dismissed so quickly because one, they could prove that they were not written. They were written about 200 years after Jesus. And the church knew that. The fathers knew that. They were like, this is a recent book. Two, they had crazy stuff in them. Like the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Thomas is presented. I saw, in fact, I read an article this week again. I pulled it up on NPR where this writer's like, you know, the Gospel of Thomas was thrown out because the church was against women. And there's a phrase in the Gospel of Thomas, and there is. There's this verse in the Gospel of Thomas where Peter says to Jesus, Mary can't be included because women can't have spiritual life. And Jesus corrected him. And the early church hated that. They hated that women were being lifted up in that way. And that's why they excluded it. I wish the writer in NPR would have read the rest of the verse, actually, in the Gospel of Thomas. You know what it actually says? It does. Peter says, Mary can't be included because she's a woman. Because the writer of the Gospel of Thomas was very sexist. And then Jesus' response in the Gospel of Thomas is, I know Peter, but I'm going to turn her into a man. In fact, every woman I turn into a man then can have spiritual life. Yeah, he kind of conveniently left that part out. And so the early church, when they're reading through stuff like that, they go, this is not scripture. And these things got tossed. I, I, I say all this, guys, every one of these things we could drill down so much. I, I just would ask, when you hear this latest new thing and that, it's not like we haven't studied these things. It's not like there's Christian scholars who haven't spent years, in some case, centuries pouring through this. It's not like there was no process in this. That yes, it's an act of faith that God superintended that process, but he used the rationality of his church and the leadership in that. So you might go, okay, even if they were the right ones were accepted, how do we know today, and this is a key question, how do we know what we have in this Bible is actually reliable to what was written back then? There's a guy named Bart Ehrman. I don't know if you've read any of his books. He, his book, Misquoting Jesus. If you're a college student, you probably have because it, it 
all across the college uh, campus, and especially for kids who grew up in the church, they've really struggled with airmen because airmen grew up in the church. He grew up in the church and he went to Moody Bible Institute for his undergrad, and then he went to Wheaton College for his graduate work, and then he went to Princeton, study under Bruce Metzger, and he totally rips the Bible to shreds. And, and Airman looks at it and, and he goes, even if you thought that was accurate back then, it's been so corrupted since then. You can't trust that what you have is anywhere even close in that process. In his book, Misquoting Jesus, he said, we could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the text of the New Testament came to be changed either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. In, in, in fact, he documents, he says, I, I've got at least 400,000 errors in the text. The corruption in that. So, you think you have anything close to maybe what was written then? How could you ever trust this? And, and I, I'm going to tell you, man, his work and people in it, it is shipwrecked. The faith of a lot of young people who kind of go, whoa, what do I do with that? Maybe what I believe all along isn't true. That's why I think it's important we have some Sundays where we do this, a little more lecture and we dive in with it. Because I think we've not built a resilient faith, built on facts and the truth with that. And so we, it's good to dive in that way. And it is almost like we've taught kids from children's ministry on, like, you know, the Bible did just come straight down out of heaven, or God took his finger and he wrote it in that way. I think understanding the process, understanding some of this, helps us be able to really wrestle with it in a healthy way. Here's what you need to realize. We have none of the original documents. We have none. So we, we don't have the book of Matthew that Matthew wrote. We don't have the book of John that John wrote. And, and, and part of that is because they were written 2,000 years ago and just the decay of time with that, especially with those that were that writing. Remember, as the church recognized it, they started getting passed around. They started getting copied. They started getting handled in a way. But God in his providence, and this is the part where I go, I love how God always leaves these places where he goes, yeah, are you going to trust by faith? God in his providence, there's not one of those original documents. So what we have is copies of that because the originals decay. I, I love how C.S. Lewis says, he says, the moment a miracle enters the natural realm, no matter what the miracle is, it obeys all the laws of that realm. Miraculous wine will intoxicate. You know, Jesus turned it into wine. It's like, oh, I can drink as much of the Jesus wine as I want. No, you'll still get drunk on it. Miraculous conception will lead to pregnancy. Look at this. Inspired books will su suffer all ordinary processes of textual corruption. They're going to they're go through all the process. The miracle of giving them doesn't deny in humanity what's going on. Miraculous bread still has to be digested, just like other bread. And, and so what we have to do is we have to go and look at it and go, okay, he says 400,000 errors. What does he mean? with that. And what he's talking about, he's talking about it, and there's this whole field of science that's called textual criticism. Uh, Christians have actually been at the forefront of it because we really want to know what the Bible says. And so they look at it, and what they describe is a textual variant. What's a textual variant? It's any place among the manuscripts in which there's a variation in wording, including word order, omission, the addition of a word, or spelling differences. So any place where they have the text, I've got like these texts of John and I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, wait a second. These two words are spelled differently. Oh, the word order is a little bit different. Oh, this was omitted in that place. And as Aaron says, there's probably 400,000 when you look at all the text of that. Now, some of you go, well, how would that happen? Well, let me go back and remind you. When they were doing this, there's no computers. There's no spell check. I mean, some of you, if you didn't have spell check, you would have been fired last week. <laughs> They're handwriting everything. Now, they had rigorous rules as they handwrote it. The scribes would go through it. They'd count the letters of it. But let, let's go back to that Paul passage. So let's say I gave you this scroll and, hey, this is from the Apostle Paul. And I told everybody here, get out a blank piece of paper right now blank piece of paper, get a pen, and we're going to, I need you to manually write this out. 
You think we'd have any errors in here? You, you think? And, and then I might have a section over here where you guys just determined it's too much work. I'm going to just cheat off of hers. And so if she makes a mistake, that mistake gets repeated in that whole group. So part of textual criticism, they look, oh, okay, over here in Alexandria, we have this manuscript. Oh, we see this error repeated. You understand where it went? Hey, guys, it, it's similar to what we would just call typos. That they happened because it was humans copying it. And, and so you might look at it and you go, well, Tim, if that's true and there's 400,000, how can we trust our Bible? It's a great question. Anytime, and, and this isn't just a problem for the Bible, by the way, it's a problem for all books in ancient literature. They, they have the same problem, but they're copying the same way. So what you would have to do is, what you want to do is compare, let's compare how many copies we have of something, and then let's compare them together. And so you always wanted to have more than one. If you only had one copy of something, that's not really good because that may have been an error. So the more copies you have of something, that helps you. And the older it is, it helps you. Because you want to make sure, man, this goes all the way back to the time period when it was written. Now, here's the funny part that kind of gets ignored with it. If you take all of our ancient books, Thucydides, he lived about 300 B.C., He's considered one of the prime historians of that time. We know history from that time because of his writings. Um, we have about eight copies of his writings. And the earliest is about 1,300 years after he wrote. But historians look at it and go, well, yep, but that's accurate. Caesar's Gaelic Wars. Caesar's Ga we understand that Caesar, Caesar wrote about the Gaelic Wars. You study it in history with that. We have three copies of it. And then the oldest is about a thousand years after Caesar. So there's a little bit of a gap. Uh, Aristotle, writing of Aristotle, his Pomenics. And, and you look at that, we've got, I think, five copies. Now, when you pull out Aristotle, if you studied it in college, all you had to read, I bet the prof didn't say, well, we don't know if this is really accurate. I mean, there was a big gap with it. Here's what we have with the New Testament. So you go, what do we have in the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, in Greek manuscripts, we have about 5,000 to 5,800 copies. On average, some of them are fragments, but on average, they average out to about 400 pages each. So you've, you've got this wealth of information with it. We got about 10,000 Latin manuscripts because Latin was the language of the day, especially starting in the third century. We get about 10,000 more of Coptic and Syriac. So, so you hear what I'm saying with it? When we put all these manuscripts together, yeah, you're going to see a type over here. What do you do? You compare it to the other 4,000. And you realize, oh, that's a typo. Oh, they omitted a word here. And when they go through this process of putting all those together, and by the way, there's no ancient book that has the, near this number, and the oldest of them go back to the first century. They go back to that time period. You, you put the combination of all those things together, and what you have out of that is very reliable. Guys, don't just take my word for it, because I know you go, well, who are you? I mean, Bart Ehrman teaches at Chapel Hill, and he, he's, I, I would say, the authority I look to the most on this is Dr. Dan Wallace. Uh, Dan Wallace, senior New Testament professor at Dallas Seminary, but he also leads the Center of New Testament Manuscripts. He travels all over the world and actually looks at the original manuscripts, actually studies it, and he's actually debated Ehrman several times. In fact, he went to Chapel Hill. He said, let's debate at your university. You can have home court because I trust this. You know what Wallace pointed out? 99% of textual variants, they make no difference. They're typos. In fact, Craig Blomberg said if you applied the same thing to Ehrman that he applies to the Bible, the first edition of Ehrman's book had 100,000 copies. There were 16 typos in it. So he said if you multiplied it the way he does against Bible text, 100,000 copies with 16 typos. He had 1.6 million errors in his book. How could you ever trust it? That's what he's doing in this. 99.9% .9 we can look at it and we go, okay, yeah, we have exactly, and we know what the text was with it. Now, some of you go, okay, what is that last little bit? There are some places where we struggle with this. 
Um, one of them, here's one of the verses, Mark 9, 29. Jesus is telling his, his uh, followers they're about to cast out demons. He said, this kind of demon cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. There's a lot of manuscripts that stop right there. There's a lot of them that add the word and fasting. And frankly, we don't have the evidence to know which one is it. And so I would say to be safe, if you're doing an exorcism, I'd fast too. <laughs> See, there's no fundamental difference in belief. In fact, you know, there's only two passages. There's two passages in the Bible of any extended length that we do. We look at them as problem passages because we, we don't know were they in the text or were they in that place in the text. The two passages, John 7 53 through 811, the woman who was caught in adultery. And, and as you look at it, I just pulled this footnote out of my Bible. If you open one of the blue Bibles, before you get to this passage, it'll say right there, this passage is not included in some manuscripts. Same thing over here at the end of Mark 16, 9 through 20. We're not sure. We're not sure on those passages. If you open your Bible, any version of the Bible, it'll say it in big letters right there. This isn't in some of the earliest manuscripts. These are the only two. And we've never been hiding them. It's, it's footnoted right in front of you there. My point is, as Christians, we don't have anything to hide with this. We actually have the science on our side with this. And so when you come to those places, even Ehrman had to admit it. When, when the, the, the paperback copy of his book, Misquoting Jesus, came out, there's an interview in the back of it. It's, it's interesting. And they asked him, one of the commentators said, so which of the key doctrines of Christianity have been destroyed by all this textual evidence? Look, look what Ehrman said. Well, essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript of the New Testament. Even he had to admit, they're, they're not impacted by this. It's a kind of a smoke screen. Let me show you all the typo places when all along we've been studying it. And we know that. Now you may hear that and you go, yeah, but Tim, I mean, isn't it all legends? Wasn't it all built on legends? This, this whole book with that, and you, you hear that. Again, this is where I rely on experts. Um, I, I know we love C.S. Lewis for his Christian writings. You realize C.S. Lewis, though, was an expert on myths and legends and literature. That was his expertise. He taught at Oxford, he taught at Cambridge. And one of the things that led him to the faith, because he was so uh, well-versed in studying what a myth and legend looked like, as he started reading scripture more, he realized these don't match. In fact, he, he said within it, I've been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all my life. I know what they're like. I know that none of them are like this. You don't present your heroes in this way. You don't write about the flaws like this. None of them resolve in this way. He said, none of the gospels in particular, they're not legendary as we understand legend. The other part is they actually include all these facts. They include places. They include cities. In fact, you read through the Bible. The Bible out of every holy book includes more history, more locations, more places, which for a long time was held against the Bible because they go, oh, we've never even discovered these cultures. This was all made up until they started digging. And, and I would just tell you, archaeology has been one of the Bible's best friends. I, you know, I just pulled up some, in 1867 when they discovered Hezekiah's tunnel. And they discovered it was exactly as it was described in scripture. The Moabite stone that unlocked the whole Moabite culture that they didn't know existed in the way, except that it's described exactly like the Bible. The Lakish letters that describe battles with it. The Dead Sea Scrolls that suddenly now predate the writing of the Old Testament before the time of Jesus. Uh, the Cate of Hinnom Scroll, this metal scroll that goes back hundreds of years before the time of Jesus that validates with it. The Tel Dan inscription, that was in 1993. I remember when it came out. Because up until that time, King David was considered a legend, kind of like King Arthur. They, oh, there was no real King David until they started digging and the Tel Dan inscription suddenly said, oh, the household of David. And they keep digging. Guys, guys archaeology backs this up. I, I love Nelson Gluick. Or just give you one archaeology thing with it. Uh, when in John 5, 2, the sheep gate in Jerusalem called Bethesda, he describes there were five colonnades. There were five roofed areas. This is when Jesus is healing the man who was lame in the water. And for years, scholars looked at this because in around the 1860s, 
they discovered the sheep gate. They discovered this pool and they said, there's no colonnades. And so it was like, oh, this disproves the Bible. Till they kept digging. And then over the next hundred years, as they kept digging at that site, they suddenly found the foundations. They realized, oh wait, it's a five-sided pool. Oh wait, here's the foundation for five colonnades. Because this has happened over and over and over again with archeology, span over again. If you're here and you're like, oh, I'm a hard proof kind of guy, I'd encourage you to read it, study it. I love how Nelson Gluick, he, the, the Jewish archeologist, he said it may be stated categorically that no archeological discovery has ever contradicted a Bible reference. Now you say, Tim, that may be all true, but, but isn't the Bible inconsistent internally. And one of the things I get all the time, and aren't there a lot of contradictions of the Bible? And, and again, I, I, all these topics, we're just nibbling at them. I'd encourage you to dive into them because I'll hear that. It'll be said categorically, oh, there's so many contradictions in the Bible. I was like, all right, give me one. Well, I just, I, you know, I saw it on YouTube. YouTube, there's a, there's a lot of contradictions out of there. They don't tell, I mean, Jesus tells the Beatitudes one way in Matthew and he tells the other way in Luke. And I go, yeah, they're different sermons. And I hate to break it to you. I've preached on topics a lot of times. I've used the same illustration. If you compare my notes together when I tell it, at different times you tell it with different emphasis. If you have different eyewitnesses, uh, one that's thrown out is, you know, John talked about Mary at the tomb. It talks about the angel that spoke to her. Or John actually talks about the two angels. Matthew talks about the angel. And one and two. If you go back and read those texts, there's no point in it where Matthew is sitting there talking and it says, oh, there was only one. He just says, I'm talking about the angel that spoke to her. Eyewitnesses to anything today will bring a different perspective with that. Uh, one of them that's thrown out is Judas' death. Look, look at this. In Matthew 27 and in Acts 1.18, uh, Matthew describes Judas' death, throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple. He departed, he went out and he hanged himself. Luke describes it in Acts. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. So some people go, see, it's a contradiction. He hung himself. Here it says his bowels gushed out. Is there a plausible connection here? Yeah. In fact, in history, they look at it and said, they believe Judas's body was probably left there after he hung himself because he was in disgrace. So either when he hung himself, the rope broke, and then when he fell, he gushed out, or his body rotted there to the point it fell, and then it gushed out. Uh, he's trying to emphasize how the curse of it that he was under. Again, I, I would say every place that you see this, when people go, oh, it's a contradiction. Guys, there's plausible testimony on this. Don't take it at face value in that. As you look at it as well, I, I would just go, Sir Frederick Kenyon, one of the greatest paleologists, he says, the general result of all these discoveries and all this study is to strengthen the proof of the authenticity of Scripture. Our conviction that we have in our hands in substantial integrity, the veritable Word of God. One, one of the chief researchers, paleographers, Sir Frederick Kenyon, in his research, he goes, hey, you don't have to shirk. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be scared every time a new Bart Ehrman or somebody comes along. People have actually studied this. We don't believe it just got handed down out of the sky. There's a process that we hold on to. Now, some of you here, you're like, yeah, but Tim, even if everything you just said is true, when I read the Bible, isn't the Bible just culturally repressive? I mean, I mean, morally repressive, culturally. I read a phrase like, you know, slaves obey your master. Is it promoting slavery with that? Here's all I would ask you in each of those contexts. Let's take that one. Slaves obey your master. The slavery that Paul's addressing in Rome is nothing like the slavery that was practiced in this country. It's a totally different process. It was a process where you would go if you had no money. And you wanted to start a business. You wanted to buy a house. You would go to someone and say, I want to sell myself into slavery. I'll be indentured. And so you give me the $20,000 and I'll work over this number of years. And I can buy myself out at any time, by the way. You don't own me. It's just we've done a contract on that. 
uh, I hate to break to you, it's not much different than your mortgage now. You've done the same thing, you've just done it in different terms. And so that's what Paul's talking about. He says, hey, if you've done that kind of contract, you work hard in it. Paul would never affirm the owning of a human being. In fact, it was Christians who used the Bible to look at it and go, this is atrocious. People look at it and they go, yeah, but you know, I read these, you can't wear kind of shirt and you can't eat certain foods. Go back and look in the history and look, we looked at it in the book of Acts. God even later as he progresses in that, he goes, yeah, that was for that time period, it's not for now. All that to say what you may think is culturally repressive, at least give it in its context what the Bible's actually saying out of it. And I know some of you, you go, yeah, but Tim, regardless of all that, I mean, it's morally repressive. And you're going to, I'm going to let some book written in tell me how I'm supposed to live my life, tell me how I'm supposed to have my sex life, tell me how I'm supposed to be. This is a breaking point for a lot of people, and I get it. The, the question I have is, though, what is your standard? What is God in your life? And for a lot of people, here, here's what I hear from them, that it should come from within. Man, I decide me, not some book that was written. I decide what I want to do. I am my standard in that. I got to be me. Now, the question I would have, though, is what if the person right next to me, he tells me, yes, I got to be me, and I'm a serial killer who loves to eat pastors, and I got to be me, so I'd love to have you for lunch. Should I just go, well, he, he should be him. Now, you hear that, and you go, well, Tim, there, obviously, there's some things you can't do. Well, according to whom? Once you start drawing lines, guys, something's got to be your authority. And, and for us as Christians, we look at the miracle of how the Bible came. We look at the story of how the Bible came. We look at the facts behind the Bible. We look at all these things that I, I would really would encourage you, if you've never looked at them, investigate it. And yes, it will cut across your life no matter who you are. Yes, it will call you to things no matter who you are. But when you want some standard that you go, if I'm going to have to have my life shaped and cut across and I'm going to have to define it, I don't know. I would rather define it by truth. And I believe based on how the Bible is delivered and the validation, and especially the validation of Jesus, I believe it's true. And maybe I lost some of you go, well, I can't even believe in Jesus. You need to come back next week. We'll talk about that as well. Final, final question is, what difference does it make? And, and I would just encourage you in that, look through human history, how it's shaped the world. I, I like the word of Teddy Roosevelt. He, he says, no other book of any kind ever written in English has ever affected, so affected the whole of life of people than the Bible. No other book has. And, and I'd say for my own life, going back to the Bible, here's what I found to be true. David described it this way. He said, uh, he said, God, your word's like a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It shows me where to go. He describes it in, in Psalm 1, David describes it, and he says, hey, the, the person who wants to know truth, he rests in God's word. And, and look what happens. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and in all he does, he prospers. There's this promise in it. God wants you to flourish. Because if there is a God, wouldn't he speak to us? If he's the designer of it all, wouldn't he want to give us instruction? Wouldn't he want to show us the way, even when it's hard to follow? And I want to encourage you, if you're here as a Christian, you've grown up in the church, you can trust your Bible. And you don't have to be scared. And when the latest scholar comes, I promise you, there's a scholar in the faith. They're talking to them. They're debating them. There's good answers. If you're here, maybe you've never read the Bible. You don't even know where to start. I, I would encourage you. This my, my encouragement is always start in the book of John. Go to the New Testament, the fourth gospel, John, and just read through it. Because John said, I wrote it that people could understand that Jesus actually is the way. He is who he is, says he is. And you read there with it. You know, years ago, when I was in college, I was in New York. 
And we were uh, there on a, a week, about 800 college students, high school students, going through the city. We were in different sites, and we were sharing, sharing the gospel with people. And I was leading this choir. I wasn't a part of it, but I was a leader of it, 20 students from Michigan. And, and getting them on and off, we were taking subways everywhere, and especially when you'd hit rush hour and all that, just making sure everybody got on the same subway. And I would tell them all the time, we were instructed, do not start conversations on the subway because <laughs> you got to make sure you get off on your right stop. And I remember we were there one day and, and we're sitting there and this young man came up to us and he said, can we talk? And I was like, no. <laughs> and he said, please, can I talk to you guys? And finally I said, what, what, what is it that you want? And he pulled out this Bible. And he said, I see all of you are carrying this. He said, I found this on the street about three months ago. And everything in me tells me the truth is in this, but I can't understand it. And I looked at the team. I said, we're getting off at the next stop. <laughs> and we got off on the subway platform and we sat there for about an hour and talked to this guy. And he had started reading in Genesis and he was like, yeah, I, I don't understand this book, Leviticus. I'm stuck in that. I said, you know what, let's go, let's go to John. He said, you're allowed to do that? I said, you're allowed to do that. And we started reading through John and I started telling him about Jesus. And I'll never forget, he just lit up. And as we told him the good news, he looked at us, he said, I knew the truth was in here. And we prayed together, got him connected to a church there. I hope you know that. The, the truth in here. And we can debate the facts and the text and all the different parts. But at the core of the Bible, it's the truth about Jesus. And if you've never discovered that, don't you owe it to yourself to at least read through it. At least read through the book of John. And as you do so, just ask yourself, man, God, if you're real, will you speak to me through your word? Let's pray together. Father, we come, we do thank you. We thank you that uh, you gave us your word. Lord, I thank you that you superintended a process in so many places throughout history to give us the accuracy of this text. But Lord, I, I thank you that it still requires faith. You've designed this in a way that you want us to lean and trust you, even with your word. Lord, I pray today, if anyone's never spent some time in your word, would you draw them to it? Would they take the time to read through it? Lord, I pray for today for those who maybe been a part of the church and they've, they've been worried about all these things they hear with it. Could you give them confidence? Lord, I, I pray for all of us today who cherish your word. Would we spend the time with it that it actually is a lamp and a light that we would flourish because you're a God who loved us so much, you communicated. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Amen.